So thanks everybody for coming. Good to see so many people online and welcome to this talk. So uh, I'll also start by introducing myself a bit as, as quite a few of you probably don't really know me. So yeah, I'm Taya Torvela and um, I'm from Finland originally, uh, although I've been in the UK for, for quite some time now. And just to give a bit of background, I've been sort of back and forth between academia and industry. Uh, a few times over the years. Um, I worked in exploration consultancy both before and after my PhD, until then finally settling in academia in 2009 when I started my postdoc in Aberdeen. <clears throat> and I've been in Leeds since 2012, and, and, and most of the research and teaching I do is in structural and field geology and ore deposits. But yeah, enough about me, uh, by gold, by Scotland in particular. Uh, and I'm not doing gold so much from an exploration prospecting point of view, although that is, of course, interesting. Uh, but my main drive uh, to look into gold is more academic, and I think gold is quite an interesting research subject. And the first reason for that is that gold is actually a marker for significant hydrothermal activity in an evolving mountain belt. And the timing and the location and expression of this hydrothermal activity, it can actually tell us uh, a lot about how the mountain belts uh, evolve in general. And gold itself, gold isn't just gold, it contains um, various other metals as well, and inclusions, for example. Uh, but because gold is pretty inert uh, in the surface environment, it does retain those signature, those chemical composition compositions don't really change that much. So looking into what else is in the gold, give us information about the fluids. <clears throat> and the second reason to look into gold is that, um, and look into uh, various deposits is that there's a lot of variability between gold and gold deposits along a single mountain belt. And it is not, not always clear what really causes that variability. And it seems to be only partially related to different timing uh, of the formation of the deposits. Uh, some deposits form approximately at the same time, but they can show quite different characteristics and it's not really clear why that is. So to address um, these broader research questions, I think the Caledonian Appalachian belt um, is actually quite a good place to study that. Uh, that belt reaches all the way from Eastern uh, US all the way up to Norway <clears throat> and it's it's a great natural laboratory uh, because it uh, contains quite a lot of various gold deposits and our research group at Leeds we have a few PhD projects looking into particular gold occurrences and deposits along this belt all the way from Newfoundland to Scotland and two of the students um, are specifically focused on the Loch Tay area mineralization in Scotland. And one student who finished last year uh, had a big part of a PhD on the Kononish deposit in a time room, which I presume you've all heard about since, since the mine opened there uh, two years ago. <coughs> but I do have personal reasons as well. Um, I, in fact, I do divide my time between Leeds and Scotland because my partner lives in Scotland. So that's another reason why Scotland is particularly interesting to me. But anyway, um, let's get on with the main business of the evening. So this talk is about gold in Scotland, obviously, and it's really just a, uh, about how the record of the different localities where gold has been found evolved through time. But it's also a story about how approaches the gold exploration involved and to obtaining and presenting geological data and information, how that evolved through time as well. And, and ultimately, of course, how that all uh, led to bedrock discoveries, uh, something that people really struggled with before the 20th century. But I'll, I'll come clear, uh, clean straight away though, and, and I'll just say that nothing that I'm about to say it's very difficult to find if you just do a little bit of digging. So if you're here in the hopes of hearing about unpublished uh, gold localities, then I'm afraid you will be disappointed. Uh, I, I thought I'd start with a poem of 
Robert Burns, which I came across when I was looking into the history of gold exploration in Scotland. And don't be afraid, I'm not going to attempt to recite it to you, but I thought that the line he put here uh, is quite fitting with today's talk. It mentions Scotland's gold bubbling fountains, uh, although being Robbie Burns, who, who, who knows what he actually meant by that. Uh, but either way, um, even though gold is quite widely spread in Scotland, I think gold bubbling is probably a little bit of an exaggeration nevertheless. But it does show that the gold occurrences and the occurrence of gold in Scotland was known already in the 17th century and in fact even well before that. So my story actually starts quite a while back uh, as there are records showing that gold was mined in Scotland already in the medieval times. Uh, this book is a bit, little bit later than that. So it's by Atkinson, Stephen Atkinson, 1619, and it's perhaps the most famous of the early ones mentioning gold in Scotland. And also is, of course, written in quite a rambling style that was typical of the day. It is quite a fun read, nevertheless. There was um, one famous area in Scotland during that time that is, of course, the focus, excuse me, <coughs> the focus uh, of this book, uh, much of Atkinson's writing. And that area, uh, of course, is the so-called Crawford Muir, in southern uplands, not here with these stars. And there is actually a, a small place called Crawford next to next to the M74 motorway um, south of Abington. But the Crawford Muir area that Atkinson talks about is actually um, around the villages of Leds Hills and Wanlockhead. Um, these are the two stars further to the to the west in, in this image here, in this map. But Atkinson, he also speaks about localities further east near Glengaber, which was also mined in the 16th century. And you might be interested to know that gold from southern uplands was used to make the Scottish regalia in the mid 1500s. But um, by and large, in 1500, 1600, there wasn't really any other gold mining apart from these area. Uh, but gold localities were known elsewhere but they don't seem to have been super profitable. I'm bits and bobs, but not really, not really sort of large scale mining seems to have taken place. Uh, this uh, 1825 edition does add some historical knowledge, not knowledge of these other localities. Uh, for example, Blink Clover uh, in Angus. Uh, gold was also extracted from the N3 copper mine um, in Stirling. There was uh, alluvial gold in the borders and in Fife, apparently, uh, and also several localities near Aberdeen. And he also mentioned Sunderland all the way up north. Uh, I think a bit of jump in time forward because there isn't much, uh, at least not easily available after, after this book until the 19th century. I wanted to mention there's one of the localities here is five, which, which uh, uh, I want to mention because there was a gold rush in inverted comma gold rush in 1852 uh, in five. And that was triggered by the global sensation that was the Californian uh, gold rush and by the many, many reports of rich gold finds in Australia and how anyone could get fabulously rich by digging the gold. So when a local man at Kinswood reported some glittering minerals on a nearby hill, apparently thousands came to the area to try their luck. But what they mostly find was pyrite, not gold. <clears throat> so they went home empty-handed and slightly embarrassed, I'm sure, as well. Um, there has been later gold finds in the large area. I'll come back to that later. Uh, and indeed, the 1825 edition of the Atkinson book did mention gold near Ballingry, which is not far from Kingswood, but these, at least it appears to me that these were separate localities. Anyway, uh, in the same year, 1852, uh, Harkness here presents <clears throat> uh, his research on the bedrock of the Ledils area. And 
this seems to be really the first one to specifically try and identify the gold source in the bedrock. Uh, and indeed, it seems to be the first one to publish a more systematic approach to gold exploration in Scotland in general. So it seems that from the sort of mid 19th century research efforts and exploration efforts started to be a little bit more scientific in terms of really thinking about where the gold is coming from. Uh, he describes uh, Silurian rocks in quite some detail, including the fact that they are very deformed, greatly disturbed, as he puts it, and it, they host plenty of quartz veins and, and granitic dikes. So although he did not actually do any analysis of the rocks themselves in terms of geochemistry uh, or gold content, he, um, he makes some suggestions based on these observations that the gold is not originating from the Silurian rocks themselves, but it's connected with the veins and dikes. Um, but he doesn't actually identify um, the source of the gold in the bedrock. But to be fair, we still don't know for sure what is the source of gold in this area. So in general, there was a bit of buzz uh, around gold in Scotland and in Britain in general in the mid 19th century, the, the Californian gold rush probably playing a big part of it. Uh, so this book, book by John Calvert, uh, 1853, uh, <clears throat> this is essentially a review or a list of historically known or and possibly also just rumored gold localities across Great Britain and Ireland. Uh, but he does include a mention of Glen Quay and Glen Torret that I haven't seen mentioned elsewhere. And he also mentions a one and a half ounce nugget that was found in Sutherland. And if you know about gold and and um, an alluvial gold, one and a half ounce nugget is quite a chunky, chunky find. So so yeah, very interesting, I'm sure. <clears throat> Another book, same year by Jervis, in addition claims that there was some gold historically extracted from um, a lead mine in the River Taff in Glenesk, in present Angus, uh, in the turn of the 16th and 17th centuries. So this is this is historic uh, knowledge that made it its way into into this book. Uh, <laughs> I included this amusing side note here. Calvert is very insightful man clearly because he notes uh, that gold occurs either in situ or it doesn't. Uh, and I'm not quite sure what, <laughs> what other alternatives there are, but there we are, moving on. <clears throat> so um, several other new uh, localities or occurrences were published in the following years, although these are mostly in connection to existing lead mines. Uh, for example, in 1854, Vitis published several articles in Perthshire, Perthshire Korea, uh, talking about the bug hidden lead and gold mine near Loch Earnhead. And apparently this mine yielded quite a lot of gold in addition to the lead, but it wasn't mined for a very long time because the transport costs were too high for it to be sustainable. And not far from Balkhida at Corribui, south of Loch Tay, there was another old lead mine that also yielded, yielded some gold and silver. Uh, as mentioned in this paper by Tost in 1860. <clears throat> um, and then, geologically perhaps slightly more interestingly, uh, 1867 came probably the first paper trying to assess gold prospectivity in Scotland specifically and in more sort of general geological terms. And I'm not going to go into, into it in huge detail, but, but this paper by Lord Lindsay, who we'll hear about more uh, in uh, slightly later in this talk, he compares Scotland to New Zealand, uh, where many profitable gold deposits have been found. And he divides, div divides Scotland into three gold fields, the southern, the central and the northern gold fields. And these actually more or less follow the currently known major terrain boundaries that are delineated by the Great Lynn Fault and the Southern Uplands Fault. Uh, we do now, of course, also define the Highland Boundary Fault, 
between these two that separates the Grampian terrain from the Midland Valley, but that didn't seem to feature in Lindsay's thinking as a significant boundary. Um, I think, and you will see uh, in our in the final treasure map that it is probably quite an quite an important boundary in terms of controlling where the gold deposits are and what what type of gold deposits they are. Although I won't have time to go into that in particular. <clears throat> um, it doesn't really report any new localities in the southern or the northern gold fields, but it does report on the large nuggets found in Helmsdale water in Sutherland. Um, in the central uh, gold field, however, he does mention several new localities, um, including Tyndrum, although, um, and that, that was, it seems that like that was the first time that Tyndrum was acknowledged as uh, a gold locality in Scotland, um, but it was still alluvial gold. They still hadn't found the actual bedrock um, source. So the gold bearing veins that are now being mined by Scott Gold. Uh, but none of this, his, his page, his, this paper and anything else, it, none of this really resulted in any significant, significant finds in terms of actual mining and extraction. So there was a lot of buzz uh, around, but nothing, nothing really seemed to come out of it in the end until something really shook things up. It is interesting to note, uh, and you might have noticed, that several authors had reported some gold finds in Sutherland, uh, some quite significant nuggets, uh, but it seems that the general public hadn't really clocked this. Or, um, uh, well, maybe they had, but in the uh, at that time, or until 1865, the area had been just too difficult to reach, probably. The railway wasn't built to reach Brora until um, 1865. So it was quite a difficult place to get to. So when the railway was there, and then another gold find was made in late uh, 1868 near Kildonan, which is just a valley from Helmsdale, uh, this made the news. It triggered the Sutherland Gold Rush of 1869. And that was a proper gold rush because it actually found some gold. And if you're really interested in this, there is this book by Calendar and Reason, uh, which I think is still available to buy online. Um, but basically up to 600 men is estimated to have come to kill Donan to pan for gold in the area. Um, the numbers did drop fairly soon though, because the Duke of Sutherland, who owned the land, of course, um, started issuing mining licenses. And the miners also had to pay a 10% royalty on any gold they found. Now, we don't know how much gold was recovered in the end. Um, Campbell here in this book from um, 1869, uh, he'd been there and he'd actually even participated in the mining a little bit. And he notes that uh, by spring 1869, a half million pounds worth in, in today's money uh, worth of gold had already been mined uh, at that time. Calendar and Reason in the book say that it might have been as much as 400 kilograms, which would be over 20 million pounds in today's money. But we don't really know. It, it was clearly fairly significant either way. The gold rush only lasted for about a year, though. Um, like Campbell here uh, in, in this book notes, the tenant farmers in the area started to claim compensation for the damages caused, particularly the sheep farming. So that in the end, the Duke decided um, that it wasn't really fair, worth the fact, I and mean, it wasn't really worth for him to allow the mining to continue. So he put a stop to it. So it wasn't really because of lack of gold that the mining stopped. It was very much the conflict of interest between the tenants, the landlord and the miners. And yeah, unlike today, um, there was no environmental and societal legislation to address such conflicts in the Victorian times. I did, in fact, spend half an hour looking around when I was <clears throat> there earlier this year, and I did, <laughs> I did actually manage to find something which which uh, is more than I expected, considering that there's been 150 years of gold panning in the area. 
So yeah, I did find something, but I can't really say it will make me rich. So uh, yeah, I just released it back into the wild. <clears throat> anyway, this Campbell book is quite interesting in other ways too, geologically speaking, because it does detail um, quite well where the gold is found in the sediments. It, it, it does contain quite good descriptions about that. And he also speculates on where the gold was uh, ultimately coming from. And it is interesting to note that the effects of glaciers and glacial transport of sediments was well recognized even at this time. And this work in particular speculates on, on how far the gold might have traveled with the sediments that were transported by the glaciers and ice sheets. And he seems to conclude that probably not that far away, although he does recognize that the ice sheet reached all the way to Scandinavia, uh, although that's probably too far for the gold to actually have come from. So <clears throat> the gold rush, of course, it triggered major interest in gold in Scotland again, and several papers were published in the following years, although not many reported any new finds. And um, many of these authors and researchers, they tried quite hard to identify the bedrock source for gold in Sutherland. And this paper by Joas uh, in 1869 is, I think, the first to really robustly describe the bedrock at Kildona and Ashiskill, where most of the gold was found. And he produced some quite detailed maps, and the Geological Survey is also mapping the area at the time, and, and cross sections too, and notes that the gold seems to be associated with quartz veins and granites, and that it is really rare to find significant gold in streams where these rocks are absent. So um, his conclusion was, in the end, the bedrock source might not be a single rich deposit, but as he puts it, uh, several independent centers. Uh, then this paper by Cameron, 1870, adds to this same suspicion that the gold is not far traveled, but equally that is probably not uh, a simple deposit either. Uh, and Cameron here, he makes quite detailed observations on the size and morphology, so particularly the roughness of the gold grains that were <coughs> excuse me, recovered uh, <coughs> in, in the streams and in the sediments. And the majority of grains were apparently quite rough, so not very far, far traveled at all. But there are some variation, variations between localities and between streams apparently, which led him to conclude that the source is probably mostly local, but more than one source is likely to be present. So effectively uh, agreeing with Joas a couple of years uh, or a year earlier. But the bedrock source, again, was never found and, and it still hasn't been found today. So an interesting gold exploration in Scotland did remain for some years following the gold rush as uh, shown by this review by Cochrane Patrick in 1879. And this again lists pretty much all of the known and rumored gold localities uh, across Scotland. And, it, <clears throat> and sort of here from, from this point onward-ish, it's quite interesting to note how the scientific publications started to get well, more scientific in terms of trying to actually quantify things rather than being just very descriptive. Like, like this paper by Dutchen in 1876, they analyzed uh, the composition of the gold alloy lead hills and they concluded that it was actually quite rich in silver compared to gold from many places uh, in Australia, for example. Or this paper by Greeny, Edward Greeny, who returned to the question of the bedrock source of Sutherland gold in 1895. Uh, but this time he backed up his conclusions with some actual data and analyses <clears throat> of, of rock samples. So he did find gold in, in, in situ samples in veins. Uh, apparently one quartz vein sample uh, contained about 2.5 ppm or 2.5 grams per ton gold. And um, if you know anything about gold exploration, you know that it's it's not, it's it's not going to make you drop up and down, but it certainly is something that is going to 
pique your interest a little bit if you if you're an exploration company. So so yeah, interesting. And he also reports on some gold grains extracted from uh, crushed crushed clasts, and and they also found little you know, traces, bits and bobs of gold in 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 the silurium the sediment themselves. And all this led him again to speculate that acidic granitic magmas essentially scavenged schists from its gold and concentrated into veins and granite dikes. Whether this is true in this case or not, or in general or not, we don't really know. But it is interesting that this is still basically one of the theories that, on how gold deposits form in general, not just in gold, but in general. There are other theories these days as well, but this is this is still basically one of the, the theories. Um, things were not without controversy, of course. Uh, it appears quite interestingly that <laughs> the Scottish museums had a lot of Scottish gold on display at the end of the 19th century, but there were some who suspected that it wasn't all Scottish. Uh, Lord Lindsay in particular was quite keen to set the record straight and published at least two papers in, he, in, in which he quite strongly expresses his opinion that some of the museum specimen, specimens are not Scottish at all, but Australian. And it seems that he distinguished these based on the color and morphology of the grains. Uh, he says the Australian gold is effectively more shiny and fresh, whereas the Scottish gold is, is quite dull in color uh, in comparison, which is probably not untrue as a rule, I have to say, as much as I've seen of Scottish gold. From a sort of more outreach point of view, uh, he also calls for a better museum re representation of the geology of, of both gold mineralization and gold rocks, uh, both in Scotland and elsewhere. Uh, and I have to say, I haven't followed up this storyline here uh, enough to see if any of this was ever rectified, uh, with at least the controversial specimens withdrawn from the museum displays. Be interesting, interesting to see if it actually happened or not, if there was a reaction to, to this debate. Uh, as an interesting side note, is uh, whilst there were clearly some interest in gold in Scotland at this time and Britain in general, it's perhaps not surprising that exploration efforts never really led anywhere at this time, uh, because the gold from the colonies, particularly Australia and New Zealand, was so abundant and much more easily found and mined. And Lindsay notes in, notes in the um, 1877 paper here, quite colorful terms, uh, that the Australian gold is sort of carried in the loosest possible way about the country uh, and puts it as, as if people were just throwing bits of Australian gold uh, around all over the place. I'm not sure this was entirely accurate, but, but, but I'm sure that uh, there is a possibility that some of the gold was intentionally or not presented as Scottish at some point. But in general, <clears throat> Uh, interesting um, gold in Scotland clearly waned towards the 19th, towards the end of the 19th century. There was really only one quote unquote new locality reported near Inverness. Um, and it's just mentioned in this very short abstract by Cameron from 1885. Um, yeah, after this, it seems that there was no gold uh, exploration no active gold exploration in Scotland really uh, at all. So as we go into the new century, there are mentions of gold here and there, including some new localities, but these were made, made almost as a side note to some other work, usually mapping efforts uh, in various places. So for example, Peach et al. in 1910, um, note some rock samples that yielded gold in the Louisiana basements of Northwest Scotland. And again in 1911, report on gold found in the Strongkulin and Castles of Copper Mines in Argyle. Well, these were mostly yeah, copper, copper mines, but they were they they yielded some gold apparently as well. 
And Wilson, here notes some gold in various spectral localities in this memoir from 1921. Mostly these were known already. Again, another list of known localities. Um, but he does also include a mention of gold in the Glachenbeig copper mine in Argyle, which I haven't seen mentions anywhere else. But by and large, it seems that there was no real interest in exploring the gold in Scotland for much of the 20th century. Nothing really happened. And it took almost 100 years for the exploration to pick up again. And even then, the exploration interest in the UK didn't really start specifically because of gold. Uh, there was a more general push to find and develop UK mineral resources from um, 1950s onwards, both by the government and the BGS to encourage exploration and, and um, investment by private exploration companies. There was a program in the late 1950s and 1960s to acquire particularly airborne geophysics and some, some sediment sampling, all that at a fairly low resolution, but it was the first countrywide geophysical survey conducted in the UK, hopefully not the last though, because it should be updated and made slightly better resolution if I if if I'm if I have anything to say about that. But then in the early 1970s, it was conduct concluded that it was time to put some boots on the ground and really gather data on mineral potential in the UK in general in a more robust and analytical way. So, so that was the start of the Mineral Reconnaissance Program, or MRP, that was run by the BGS. Uh, and they employed a range of more modern techniques, such as geochemical analysis on bedrock and stream sediment samples, ground-based geophysics, uh, structural analysis of the bedrock, et cetera, et cetera. So they were really sort of more systematic approach to exploration. The MRP, it, it didn't really initially worry too much about gold. Uh, it was more about base metals and strategic metals, uh, but probably following some promising discoveries, both within the program, but also by private companies and other operators, the focus clearly shifted towards gold in the 1980s. And I guess that was basically the start of the second Scottish gold rush rush. Uh, and there were a number of MRP reports that described some gold early on, uh, but mostly these were at very low concentrations. The first MRP um, to report on more significant gold was Dawson et al. 1977, who identified both alluvial and bedrock occurrences in the western part of, of southern uplands. And the bedrock findings were confirmed with drilling uh, in the following years, and pretty promising concentrations of up to 8.8 .8 ppm were reported from coarse veins in that drill core. Uh, Dawson et al. 1979 also confirmed widespread alluvial gold in the central southern uplands, so effectively in areas near the historic Glengaber mine, but they only found traces in the gold, of, of gold in the bedrock there. So, yeah, still no bedrock source. And another locality, Phil Forburn, although with less gold, was late, later found and reported um, by Allen in 1982. Yeah, some discoveries were made independently of MRP as well, like the Gerloch uh, sulfide mineralization that also carries gold that was discovered in the early 1980s. And it was drilled too, uh, but mineralized. The mineralized body was too small so um, it was abandoned. Um, and another one here, uh, early Devonian Rhine epithermal gold mineralization that was discovered in 1988. But it was probably the company discoveries that created the biggest waves. And these were not made in the traditional uh, gold country of the Southern Uplands, but in the Grampian terrain. And this newspaper clip I came across talks about Canadian exploration companies operating in the area south of Loch Tay. Uh, at the time, it, it, it didn't seem like much came out of the Loch Tay exploration. But around the same time, 
uh, and next international finally found the gold bearing veins at Kononish near Tangram uh, with initial resource estimates of in 1990 being over 200,000 ounces of gold at an average of eight, eight grams per ton. And this has, of course, since been updated several times. And Scott Gold, who, of course, now runs the Cornish Gold Mine, uh, decided that their most recent reserves on their website are uh, half, a, half a million ounces uh, ounce of gold. That's a head grade of almost 12 grams per ton. Anyway, uh, this discovery was soon followed by the Colby Gold discovery of the Kalyaka Erler and the Tom Bowie gold veins near Aberfeldy. Uh, the Kalyaka veins in particular showed some really spectacular gold grades. Some samples yielded over 300 ppm gold, according to BGS report uh, in uh, 1988. So some quite, quite interesting grades. Unfortunately, the, the, the veins are just too small and too sparsely spaced to be economic, so, so that was ultimately abandoned. <clears throat> Another area that attracted interest was Aberdeenshire. Uh, European gold exploration found some gold in Betrock, but the grades were relatively modest at uh, about four, four ppm. So that probably at least partly led them to abandon the prospects after only two years. But exploration continued outside the company efforts as well. Uh, like Lochan, copper gold was reported by Harris uh, et al. in 1988, uh, that's in Western Scotland. And Coates et al., they did some work in the Midland Valley south of Perth, and they found quite a lot of alluvial gold, so gold in the sediments in Bourne and Glen in particular. Uh, they did find some gold in Bedrock as well, but the grades were quite low, so that didn't go forward. <clears throat> a more interesting discovery um, was perhaps the follow-up work in the Angus Glens where Gokotetal in 1993, uh, they reported uh, on a major fault zone in the eastern hills of Glen Clover, uh, up to seven ppm gold in Fort Gouge. So, the early rumors of gold in clover, uh, the sort of 19th century rumors were essentially confirmed by this work here. There was less success as well in terms of finding anything. Um, Kote et al, they went back to Loch Duich in, in the Northwest Scotland, uh, where Peter et al had reported over five PPM gold in some rock samples in 1910. They couldn't replicate those values, uh, their results. So, so this is perhaps a question mark here. Then the last MRP report to investigate gold was Gunn et al, 1996. They went to Argyle to conduct further investigations on the gold mineralization in the old copper mines. And they did find some clearly elevated grades in the samples collecting from, collected from the old mine tailings, but it seems it hasn't been really taken forward. So um, from the mid 1990s, the gold exploration activity is sort of waned again for a couple of decades. Um, there was this review report by BGS in 2003, basically just summarizing all previous work. Um, but but uh, also, these many discoveries and, and, um, and new finds that had been made in, in the previous 20 years or so, they did inspire a lot of research and a lot of PhD projects uh, on both specific de deposits and on controls on gold mineralization in Scotland and, and more widely uh, in general. So, well, that's not really the topic of this talk, so I don't have time to really go into the research aspects of it, but we do certainly know much more about Scottish gold today than we did 40, 50 years ago. But the story isn't quite over. Um, the gold price has significantly increased in the past 15 years, and that has eventually attracted 
some companies to come back and explore in Scotland again. Uh, and the opening of the Kononish gold mine in 2020 has, has further excited companies and investors, I'm sure. So maybe we are facing the third wave of Scottish gold rush. There are at least three companies that I know of, other than Scott Gold, that are exploring in Scotland. Um, Western Gold in July this year, uh, they announced that they are looking at Lagalochen again. Um, and they are actually uh, looking at the other Argyle copper gold localities too. So, so there's some activity there, it seems. Green or Gold, uh, who are focusing on Aberdeenshire. They have done some drilling too, uh, latest in 2017, and they have found something, uh, five ppm in borehole up to, well, over 50 ppm in some boulders. So that's that's obviously quite interesting results for exploration companies. But the most advanced project is probably the Loch Tay project of Green, Green Glen Minerals, who did the latest completely new uh, bedrock gold discovery in Scotland. And that was in 2020, when they found the lead trial prospect on the south shore of Loch Tay. And this is another quartz vein prospect, very similar to the one at Cononish. And uh, they reported up to 23 grams per ton, so 23 ppm at outcrop and in boulders. And they also drilled it last year. And they said that the structures, so the veins, that they might continue uh, possibly as far as four kilometers along strike. So potentially quite significant. So there we have it, a treasure map of Scotland based on the literature since 1619. It's probably not totally comprehensive and who knows, perhaps in future years, this map will be updated with new significant discoveries. Whoops, what did I do? too fast. Well, I leave you that with that and with these reading suggestions and I thank you for listening. Hope you enjoyed it and I'll take questions.